Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, so to our plant records webinar series, and today we're gonna to talk about collection value scoring. <clears throat> um, and uh, with me, Howard Oskard from Botanical Software, we have Dr. Wahid Arsad. So you will, uh, um, yeah, and, nice and also, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I was uh, interrupting you there, uh, but uh, I thought we will uh, introduce each other sort of when they start talking a bit as well, but Greg Payton from the Dorsa Arboretum is also here. So if you, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, so, so, uh, so this is a really exciting topic because um, uh, this is something we've been discussing for quite a while in our team, and we've been doing a substantial amount of research on this topic, and We've seen these questions popping up on different forums around the world as well. So uh, we thought it was useful to put this in in a in a whole uh, a whole webinar uh, session uh, to share our thoughts and what we think and what we what we've sort of come where we are at this point in time, and then also hopefully get some new ideas and inspiration from the rest of you. So we're going to have a poll later on and also a bit of a breakout session. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll get to learn a bit more about this interesting topic. Uh, and why is this interesting? Well, um, <laughs> the, the question, uh, it started by, uh, which is sort of, I think, quite a, a sort of a problem that many of us have is to communicate the value of a collection uh, with, with peers, with, with, uh, with your boss, with, with uh, supporters and sponsors, et cetera. So what, what do you have here? And, and the normal thing that people will look for sometimes in this world is, of course, how much did this plant cost or how much did this cost? And, and, and that, that is uh, all well and good, but that doesn't necessarily relate to the value for your garden. And the value is what we see, and I think a lot of you will agree to that, is linked to what your garden, what is the mission of your garden? And, and what is the purpose? Why was this set up in the first place? And then suddenly the problem becomes a bit more interesting. So, and there are all kinds of reasons why a garden was set up. It could be historical gardens, there could be conservation and research, etc. So, <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is basically finding a method of uh, quantifying that your collection is changing over time for the better or the worse. And then also communicating to not only staff, but, but uh, um, upper management and uh, other peers in the community, etc., that this plant, even though it doesn't look like much, is really valuable, or this plant for other reasons are extremely valuable and this is not. And how do you do that? So that's the whole story about this uh, presentation today. We're going to navigate through different concepts and models we have looked at and some pitfalls and some ideas and how we might improve this model. And hopefully, as we finish off for today, that we've learned a bit from each other. And uh, yeah, so uh, we think we're going to kick off straight away, actually, by just one simple poll. We're not going to have a lot of polls today, but this one hopefully should set the tone a bit um, because it, it's sort of uh, so now I, I hope that everybody is sort of in tune with what we mean by measuring the collection. Uh, and, and there's the basic one is to say, how many plants do we have? That gives you some measurement that there's more sophisticated ways to do this, which we'll talk into, but we're just gonna first do a poll about how satisfied are you today with how you measure the value of your collection? Uh, and we're just gonna roll this poll for a short while. So, so um, please answer your question. So it's a, a Likert scale from very unsatisfied to uh, very satisfied. We'll just run this for a minute or so. Okay, we're getting numbers coming in. Sadly, I'm the only one who sees it, but uh, uh, that's uh, we're going to change very soon. So we've got 30 seconds. We'll do it for 15 more seconds. And then, uh, okay, thank you so much. So uh, now you can see the results here uh, that uh, the majority of you are actually unsatisfied with 52%. There's a few who are very unsatisfied uh, and only 14% are satisfied. And then 
sort of uh, middle ground, 30% are neutral. So no, none of you are very satisfied. So yeah, that's, that's very interesting, very useful. And, and hopefully, we, we hopefully can run this one once more in a few years time and get a very different result. Uh, but uh, that's really valuable. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so then I'm gonna hand over to Wahid, who's gonna talk a bit about a few case studies. Um, yeah, thanks, Havard. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who joined our session last time on success and performance measures, I guess it's just a just very briefly give you a recap on that and how this value scoring relates to the way you target your goals and the metrics that you look at in relation to your collection. And uh, last time we talked about the importance of setting smart targets, so things that are specific and measurable achievable, relevant, and time-bound, and also the difference between vanity metrics and actionable metrics. So those, the vanity metrics are those that are, that they're metrics that feel good to look at, but they lack the clear guidance for the next steps. Whereas actionable metrics are those that can be used to inform those better decisions. So try and, it'd be good to sort of keep that in the back of your mind when we look into this value scoring in a bit more detail. But this um, case study, I thought I'd run through a couple with you all. And um, this particular one was on rhododendrons. So these stunning plants that many of you probably grow from, from Himalayas and the Southeast Asia. And in 2011, there was a report um, from the BGCI where they were, they were really looking for a, a, an urgent conservation need for seven, I think it was about 75 taxa that were on the verge of extinction in the wild. So they were either critically endangered or they were uh, endangered. And the first stage of that sort of report was to establish which rhododendrons are currently being held in ex situ collections around the world. So they set out and uh, initiated a survey across all global botanic gardens to find out what was being grown, which taxa were being grown in their collections. And the way they tackled their sort of value scoring proposition was through using the uh, IUCN red list category system. So many of you will be familiar with that, but essentially you're going from uh, high extinction risk on the right to uh, taxa that either have no data associated with them or they haven't been evaluated. And you can see at the bottom, each taxon was assigned a score. So if a particular taxon was extinct in the wild and you had it in your collection, you were given 15 points essentially for that. And you can see how as you go to uh, the least concern end of the spectrum, the value of that particular taxon uh, decreases because it's not so valuable in a particular collection when it, when it, when it, in terms of conservation. So the results of that survey were um, on the next slide, and they came up with uh, a list of botanic gardens who had the most threatened taxa in as part of their collection. And from this list, they were able to get a really strong basis on how to set conservation priorities and to really action some of these um, collections in terms of where they can be strengthened or where they where new collections can be established. So you can see at the top, the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh with, with 734 taxa, uh, and they were particular, uh, with their huge collection, they were given a, a high score, um, and you can see the rest of them there. So that was an interesting take on collection value scoring and how that relates to uh, extinction risk um, IUCN categories in this particular instance. It, it's uh, just a comment on, on the previous slide as well that you see here that data deficiency is given the rank of two because you don't really know whether it's near threat and vulnerable or something, but you know, anyway, it's a bit of a geeky comment on, on, on that often these kind of models are not straightforward, like one, two, three, four. So yeah, thank you. I would also, uh, if you go back once, uh... I think the score of zero for not evaluated is sort of misleading because it could be extremely endangered, even more so than the uh, data deficient, but it's just not been looked at yet. So exactly. Just... Yes. So it's an interesting, um, it's almost as though you want to assign that taxon with a high score. So somebody actually 
goes and does something about it. Yeah, yeah. We have a we have an interesting similar question around uh, the uh, last specimen question, which is a similar thing whether you should take it into the score or treat it differently. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so that's a really interesting uh, example of how, how that's been used um, previously. Um, the second case study is with um, Dawes Arboretum. So Greg, maybe perhaps you, you'd like to talk us through how you've tackled it. Yeah, I mean, you know, quickly, um, the previous uh, is, is good for uh, species. You know, we, uh, the Dawes Arboretum was founded in 1929 and our founding documents basically say, to collect trees and shrubs hardy out of doors in central Ohio. So that is, that's a broad palette. So we've really, in our collection policy and uh, uh, our, the, uh, the documents we've created uh, since then have had to further define what that is. So um, for species, of course, we want plants of wild origin. They're, you know, they're gonna score higher than from Bob's nursery uh, with, no, uh, with no history about where it uh, came from. Uh, the ability to obtain that specimen, you know, can you buy it at Bob's Nursery if it's a cultivar, or is it uh, is it virtually virtually un unavailable? Um, with cultivars, you have uh, uh, there's the additional scoring because the first plant ever named of a cultivar is considered the type specimen. It's the original plant, and if you have a a cutting or a a propagule directly from that original specimen, it's the closest to the original because you have situations where plants get propagated, repropagated, passed down. Somebody might have put the name down wrong or uh, collected material that doesn't exactly represent the original type specimen. So your, uh, your plant propagated from the original is going to be the most true to type in our mind. Um, and is that plant even what it says it is you know you can say you know like on these scorings for uh, the uh, the uh, the rhododendrons you can say that you have the species that's it that's virtually extinct in the wild but has has anybody keyed it out to say that is what it is so there's always the uh, uh, you know truth in the in the uh, in the verification to 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 prove what you have um and again uh We've talked about the the uh, dodo um, uh, dodo analogy coming up. I mean, um, the last specimen in the collection can score high because it's the last. But if it's common, is it is it really that important? Um, you know, you can have a plant, but if it's nearly dead, is it as important as one that isn't quite as rare but is very healthy? So there's that that ranking as well. Um, difficult to obtain and uncommon are both somewhat similar. I think uh, this is sort of a, a derivation of my actual text, which was too was a too lengthy. Um, but there's some differences there. Um, is it is it planted in a, an area of the arboretum that is not subject to um, to uh, uh, change? You know, we have uh, central grounds area of the arboretum where they can move to the visitor center, decide to put in new gardens for visitors to um, enjoy. And uh, if we had rare plants there, we have to worry about either transplanting them, repropagating them. Uh, then we have collection areas outside where hopefully things will, will stay the same for generations to come. So if it's sited in one of those areas, it's more, uh, it's, it's certainly more protected. If there's any questions, I can go further into it. But. Yeah, there, there was a comment about uh, whether uh, they, we will share any links and, and things like that. Uh, we'll, we normally now follow up with a blog article uh, where we will include a link to this recording, but also then reference to any material uh, that we have on this. Hopefully we'll have something about this particular method they use at the Dawes Arboretum as well, so that people can get a bit more sense of uh, are looking at the numbers behind it and et cetera. Yeah. It's difficult to... Uh... You know, to to take a uh, a species and score it, and then have a similar score based on a cultivar. So you have to look at different attributes of what makes the cultivar valuable and what makes the species valuable, and to have a a melded score across your collection of what's what's valuable. Um, you know, you can't just say all cultivars are not as valuable as species. I mean, that's just not how we operate. So that's our mission. Really interesting, Greg, thanks for that. So it's a really good example of using multiple traits 
as part of a collection value scoring system. And um, a similar situation occurs at Cambridge University Botanic Garden. So this isn't entirely a collection value scoring uh, mechanism per se, but they are traits that are involved in, in guiding the collection policy. So they're, they're intrinsically linked, uh, if you like. But here are some of the examples that, that they, they use. So rarity, so for example, is the, is the species rare? And, and if it's held as part of an ex situ collection, then it's given a, a, a higher value. Diversity, so many of you probably use uh, taxonomic diversity as, as a measure of your collection, uh, but it might not just be taxonomically uh, derived. It could be, for example, biogeographic diversity. So the, the diversity of a, of a group of plants that are specific to a particular part of the world, for example. Uh, Greg's already mentioned that the wild origin story, but for example, the proportion of your material that is, is wild origin. And even the proportion of your collection that's based on uh, sort of conservation assessments as the IUCN example that we talked about earlier. There's also, uh, for example, seed banking. If your garden uh, has a seed bank, then you might consider the proportion of your collection that's held as seed uh, as a particular, particularly valuable component um, as part of that scoring. And then there's things like the provenance information, the degree of duplication. So do you have multiple accessions being maintained for a particular species? Uh, and then also longevity and sustainability. So that sort of sense of turnover and, and the influx of accessions that are coming into your collection. And that can be used as an indicator of like the quality of the management of your collection. So are you on top of your, your plant records in terms of what's coming in and going out? And then finally, because Cambridge have a quite a, a visitor focused uh, collection, there's uh, some sort of more subjective perhaps or, or less quantifiable um, metrics such as uh, species that have a particular value in terms of visitor interest. And the example there is, is the Titanarum, of course. So it's interesting that some traits are quantifiable, some aren't, um, and that all is really part of um, of your collection and the mission uh, of your garden. Uh, so that's all, all very interesting there. I can also interject really quick too. Uh, uh, in addition to the really cool graphic of the Titan Aram there, it looks like it's wearing a suit with a with a turkey <laughs> tail. But, uh, <laughs> uh, to expound and even muddy the waters more on the 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 diversity aspect, we also have taken to uh, to uh, collections of plants that are from uh, from range extremes. So even native species here in the state of Ohio, like we have uh, the American beech, you know, Fagus grandifolia, uh, you know, grandifolia. Uh, we have plants of that that we are growing that are from its extreme Western range in the uh, central US near Texas, Arkansas. So the, the, the genetics of that plant are worth preserving more so than just the species in the heart of its range. So range extremes can add a, another um, ranking or level to the diversity and value of your accession of that plant. Yeah, cool. I, I was also reflecting a bit on these two examples, which are, you know, with uh, doors and with Cambridge here. It's also would be, I wish we had an example from a historic collection or a historic garden, like a, like something National Trust or, or like Monticello with Peggy and where, where you have plants that represents the storytelling of, of the, of the location, you know, maybe plants that were grown by the by the owner of that house or whatever. That, that's kind of, a, that's the point here, trying to figure out the plants, what, what kind of message do they bring or to, the, to, to, your, to your sort of mission and, and what you're trying to convey for the visitors. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the ways we've, <laughs> one of the ways we've, um, one of the examples for, for how scoring could be defined um, taking some of these parameters into consideration. So this formula looks very complicated and we actually collaborated with one of our mathematicians and together with him, we, we sort of came up with an example of how different parameters can be used. And I'll just talk you through it uh, and how it's sort of um, incorporated. So you, on the left, you've got your, the, the score at a particular given, given moment in time. 
And for each plant in your collection, it's taking the sum of these particular values. And in this example, we're looking at P, which is provenance. So again, you might consider something wild collected as higher value as something that might be cultivated, for example. Then we've got an identification level score. So was it identified by a breeder or was it a specialist or, or taxonomist? Or was it identified through sort of comparative means? Again, you can see how that sort of scoring approach might work. And then we've got two examples of conservation assessments, one at the global level and then one at the regional level. So a good example is you might, you might be growing something that in your particular region, it is, is very scarce. It's sort of a high, high extinction risk in your particular area, but globally it might not be. So there's some sort of um, interesting scenarios where you can have um, kind of opposites uh, there in relation to the conservation score there. And then you've got the condition of the plant. So for example, is it in, is it in a prime condition? Is it really excellent, well looked after? Or is it sort of mediocre or is it sort of on its last legs? Um, so there's a, a good example of one that's a little bit tricky to quantify um, in, to some respects. And then finally, uh, is it the last remaining specimen in your collection? So Havard's going to talk a little bit about that sort of paradox. But you can start to see how these individual parameters can be then added and fine tuned also for your particular mission and your collections policy and what's relevant to why you why you have your collection uh, but this is sort of one example of, of how it can be defined and we actually uh, were able to test this uh, particular equation with Greg's collection at the Dawes Arboretum and you can start to get a sense for not only the value of your collection at a given moment in time so on the left you can see the current score so there are a lot of plants that didn't score so highly, so they had a score of zero. But then you can see how the, the score increases and also the number of plants that were given that particular score. So that's, a, that's in the current snapshot. But also what's really interesting is looking at the value of your collection over time. Now, we're, we're fortunate in the case of, of Dawes Arboretum that there is that historical element there. There are data that go back to 1929. And so we were able to see how the influx and efflux of material and accessions have impacted that perceived value. And you can start to see uh, particular spikes or, you know, trough peaks and troughs throughout your collection and, and what particular event they may be associated with. So some really interesting and valuable insights that you can um, get from this and, and importantly, being able to communicate these with different team members that we talked about earlier on. Yeah, and uh, just a comment there as well. Obviously, these numbers at, from 1929, I don't know if we had the, well, that comes back to the next point we're going to talk about, but uh, what was the conservation status in 1929? There's a lot of ponderables when you start digging back. So, so a good, robust system needs to also take the whole time scale into, into account. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, if I go to the next slide here, we're going to talk about exactly that question a bit. And, and that is, uh, you know, how do you deal with stale data? Now, when you measure the collection's value, uh, it's all derived from the plants you have. So you might have a taxon that's very valuable, or you have defined one spe uh, one taxon that's very valuable for you. But if all the plants die, suddenly the collection value drops and that number is no longer available to you. So the question then comes, if you never, uh, if you record an accession and say that we have this plant and you never look at it again, at some point in time, the likelihood of this plant actually having died in the, in the meantime is, is sort of going up. Um, so, so definitely, uh, some mechanism in a system that deals with this is important so that you can keep track of the fact that you've actually done inventory, that you know that the likelihood of this plant is actually part of your collection still is there. And that goes for a couple of other things as well. You know, you might have recorded or being up to date with your taxonomy about conservation status, but that you did that 20 years ago. So things might have changed drastically. 
So uh, what we want to highlight here is that this has to be taken into account for this to work reliably. And uh, that's something we're definitely going to look into when we proceed with this uh, journey further. Um, uh, so there was uh, just a few questions here as well about uh, whether this uh, thing will be automated and uh, and so forth. And I think in a future system that we're working on as well, this will should be easy to manage on a like like a configuration aspect, and the system should help you, encourage you to make your data fresh and and not represent what we see at the bottom here, but really feels and, and is reliable. And if you want to go back one slide, uh, just to follow up on what Sean was asking about the big jumps in 95 and 2000, yep. it's actually a funny story. Uh, I began here in 1996. So around that time is when I really started coming through and I started as as, as the plant records manager. So that was my job. But uh, I started coming through the records where nobody else really paid attention looking up the origin of seeds we'd received, for example, and finding that they were of wild origin when nobody had recorded that in the past. It wasn't a major concern. So uh, that was the early jump. The second jump was the uh, adoption of our collection policy updates, uh, where we uh, really wanted to focus on plants of rare, uh, of, uh, of, of wild origin and uh, more rare um, sources. So uh, that explains the second jump. So that was was uh, most of our the acquisitions at that time were of of you know, more high the plants of uh, of a higher value. Now it would be tempting to zoom in and see when you went on holiday. When the, when the... <laughs> I can't say it's all me, but I did. I, I did try to help. So yeah, yeah. no, that's that's brilliant. What I love about this is the the time aspect of being able to show from year to year that are actually doing the right thing. And that's the that's the, one of those kind of metrics that we usually have is oh we have so many tax or whatever, and and it might not really show that you're doing the right thing in terms of your mission. So so that's a really good example. Um, uh, the other thing we wanted to mention here because it's sort of uh, when we started looking at this we were very uh, excited about the idea that when when you just have one last specimen of a given taxon in your collection that you uh, think, oh, this is really important now. Before we had two, suddenly this is much more important, so we should give it a higher rank or higher score. Uh, but, but technically, your collection is not increased in value. It's drastically dropped because you've not done your job properly, you could argue. So, um, so uh, our initial models would, would look at this as a way of, in, in, by, by, so the fact that you, you, you kill the, an ultimate plant, sorry, not kill, but that, that dies, you're giving a bonus point, which is not the right sort of method. So as far as we see now is that you, you probably should very much focus on this from a collection management perspective, but we're not sure about the, 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 the sort of usefulness of allowing this to reflect this actual total score of your collection. I mean, if it's an important taxon and all that, that's really important, but the fact that it's the last one shouldn't probably affect the total score of, of that uh, sort of of your collection. Um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about this particular one because it's uh, initially we were sort of thought that was the smart way to do it. But uh, yeah, anybody has any thoughts about that? No. Uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a bit of a, so so we we've sort of uh, for, for for ease of communication we we christened these plants uh, a dodo plants, uh, in, in that the dodo itself was extremely valuable as a for for conservation when it was around, but it didn't mean that it, it, the last one was more important than the, the two last ones. You know, it's 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 still important to conserve. So so um, anyway, uh, hopefully that analogy is good enough. Uh, <laughs> um, now, how do you communicate this uh, in, a, in a sort of sensible manner to your staff, to, to your internally, et cetera. So we looked at this a bit and, and uh, obviously we'll have these numbers flying by. So this plant is 49 and this plant is 2011 or whatever. Uh, and, and we thought we uh, look at this from a simplified mod approach. And uh, luckily Dave, our designer is here. So he's intrinsic. Uh, the contributor to try to figure out how can we make this more e easier to digest for internal etc and we just basically boil it down to a simple uh, 
it's very topical as well uh, with the Olympic uh, approach, uh, handing out silver, gold, and bronze medals. Uh, and, and then this, uh, this uh, visualization is then uh, associated with individual taxa. So they, they, um, they, uh, uh, they get a score based on the metrics they have. And accessions could also get, uh, get a score based on the taxon and some, some traits related to the actual uh, taxon, like wild collected, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's the plant themselves that, that basically affects the total score because that's what you have in your collection. And they will then be ended up with a gold, silver, and bronze medal. Um, so that's where we are now. And I think uh, we're, we're sort of, uh, we, we're going to work towards that as a, our, our sort of approach for now. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I think that, that, that most people can relate to this. Uh, the only thing missing is probably proper screens that really show, show the gold properly. That's one thing we miss, but metallic value there, but yeah. Uh, so uh, now we thought we should have a breakout discussion. Uh, so we're going to break out into uh, quite a number of rooms. Um, uh, I'm just going to look at the comments here before we go there, because we can just follow up on that quickly now. So uh, uh, th that's very true. Yeah, that you, you're absolutely say that when you have the last plant, this should trigger things like you need to propagate and 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 make sure you you uh, don't lose the last one as well. But what we're trying to say is that. Uh, that, that is a separate mechanism than actual in bumping up the total score of your collection uh, because one the second one uh, died. <laughs> so that, that's the, like the dilemma here. Uh, but it should definitely be visual and, and clear and easy to find those those taxa or those uh, those accessions where you only have one last the last one the dodo plants. Uh, but but we look at this as probably more of a separate exercise. Um, yeah. Uh, Okay, we'll follow up the rest of the comments after the breakout rooms, I think. So we have room for, uh, I think, uh, a 10 minute breakout session. Uh, and we're gonna have, uh, a, a, each room there will be five uh, delegates. So you, uh, it would be great if you nominate one person to take notes uh, about your discussion. And then we go back into uh, the session here and we share these notes. We put it on the Trello board or, or sorry, on the Myra board. Uh, and what we would like you to discuss here is, would you use a model to help guide the way you manage your collection in line with your policy? Uh, and the second one is, are there parts of your mission that you think is hard to measure using a model? So uh, Wahid touched a bit on that, where you have a list of a vague, like we should make it beautiful for visitors. I don't know, there might be other metrics uh, that, that uh, or things that are, very much part of your DNA as a garden, but you find it hard to, to, to keep track of that for some reason. Uh, so any, any, any questions from the audience before we split out to rooms? Okay, so uh, as I say, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to do 10 minutes and then we'll come back and then we'll go through the, so make sure you, um, uh, you uh, take, uh, uh, notes and uh, or designate one person to take notes. Okay. Wonderful. I, I saw that quite a few rooms were chucked out, so that means that people were actively discussing. Should it, I, I'm not sure about the length of these sessions, whether it should be, I mean, half an hour might be more useful in this context, but hopefully this is also a way of starting off this kind of discussion between you and between us and you and so forth. So. Uh, uh, so we had uh, four, five rooms. So that was great. And um, I'm going to share my screen here. And then I'm going to ask a person from each room to sort of um, uh, tell us a bit about uh, your thoughts about these two questions. Uh, so maybe we could start with room number one, which was with uh, Linda Post, Martin Smith, Sean, and Will Ritchie. Did you, did you manage to take notes <laughs> first? First of all, <laughs> yes, I took notes. Yes, um, yeah. I, I think everyone. Uh, we we almost jumped right into making suggestions. Uh, the the first question I I think was 
kind of a, a yes, but a yes, but uh, with you know some caveats. Um, the but part was um, if the scoring system was was used differently in different organizations. Um, it might, it's nice to compare among organizations, but different organizations have different values. So there might be a common set of criteria for all gardens and then some set of criteria that are more optional or specialized. Um, and not only that, there might be even uh, different criteria and needs for different parts of the garden. So a uh, horticultural or display focused part versus a conservation or wild collected um, part of the garden. Uh, on, on that to the last point, that was really interesting, both of them. But the, so if you have a high conservation value plant growing in a horticultural area, should that affect the score of that individual plant for some reason? Was that the thought or was it more that you just need different uh, sort of approaches like you have with those arboretum that they have. Uh, I think the thought that was some values aren't as important in some areas. So uh, in a more display focused area, um, you know, some of the more wild collected, for example, uh, values might not be as important and vice versa. Okay. John, it's almost like you're uh, talking about having two separate collections. You're scoring it, scoring independently. For sure. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Uh, and then I don't want to take up too much time, but a couple other comments um, about parts of the mission that are harder to measure. Um, we talked about donor plants. Um, if a donor had uh, contributed a plant, it, it doesn't, it's, it's really different. Um, it has its own really unique value. Um, it's kind of something you don't want to remove in, in any place that uh, more important than anything, anything else. Um, and then we didn't get into this, but horticultural qualities, like um, my, in, on my team, we've been talking about actual traits of plants, uh, like phenology, for example, flowering times yeah. and uh, leaf color timing. Uh, the diversity of those things can contribute a lot of value. Yeah, you have these, uh, I mean, one, one metric that pops to mind is these, uh, uh, these cultivars that given sort of AGM or other types of, uh, I don't know if they would be considered valuable, but uh, I see your point, yeah. Great, I, I love the first one, just to comment on that one as well, the comparison of uh, how, uh, it's a bit of a tricky challenge. Uh, I know that the, the Botanic Gardens in the Netherlands, for example, have worked on that in, in terms of uh, how they count the number of plants and taxa and, and so forth, and, and then having some ab ability to compare uh, collections. Uh, but obviously, comparing two distinct collections, if they have different missions, becomes tricky, <laughs> unless you then use a, the same value system for the comparison, for the sake of comparison, I suppose. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a whole new seminar or, or a webinar or a conference, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> It's interesting. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Now we're conscious of time. We should, uh, uh, yeah, great, great stuff. Uh, so maybe we should uh, jump to the room with Wahid and Peter Brownless and Peggy and Dave Toomey and Christina. Cool. I took I took some notes uh, from this room uh, since Wahid's sort of taking the notes in the mirror. Um, yeah. So um, Peter was um, uh, saying that um, uh, having a method of so, so he, they keep um, scores sort of separately at the moment, but having a method of combining all of those scores to, to create a sort of an, over, an overall score would be really valuable. Um, currently, he has all this knowledge in his head and he sort of, you know, is sort of doing the calculations on the fly. And obviously that knowledge has taken a long time to accumulate. Um, so he's asking questions like how valuable are these plants and, uh, you know, is it rare? Um, should we propagate it now? And so I think, um, yeah, having a system that <laughs> sort of did the thinking for him, I think would be really valuable. Um, we also, um, Peggy also, Peggy Cornett from Jefferson's Monticello Garden um, was talking about um, different types of vegetables that they have and um, whether vegetables that Jefferson had documented might be more valuable. Um, she also said that um, 
having a master list based on based on those categories that are sort of specific to Monticello would be really useful and it'd be good for uh, reporting to donors. And we also, uh, Christina Savdor from Santa Fe um, was uh, talking about a really interesting project uh, they're working with the O'Keefe Museum, Georgia O'Keefe, and they are planning a garden based around um, her work. Uh, and she, they also said that um, customers were interested in, customers are really interested in buying water-wise plants that um, are drought tolerant, uh, commercially available. So maybe there's an angle there, which is more about, um, you know, the value, value, I mean, commercially, commercial value of plants, I suppose, or va value of plants to sort of the local community. Yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. That, uh, does all, all this align straight with, we had a discussion where he did myself as well uh, and Greg this morning about uh, the the mission is often a bit woolly and 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 what shall I say uh, not necessarily specific and then you have a collection policy that might be more targeted and and sometimes these these metrics can be more easy derived from a collection policy or not but I don't know if uh, I'm trying to keep track of time a bit so I'm not going to go into the discussion but you know that that might be some of those kind of like uh, commercial drought tolerant plants for example it might be more of a hard to find in a mission specifically, but maybe from a collection policy perspective. I don't know. I can see Christina nodding, so <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, let's move over to the next room here, which was with Christy, Greg, Rupert and Shari, who is speaking on our behalf. Well, I uh, I did most of the talking and I did, I did scribble down some notes, even though I was begging for somebody that could read. <laughs> <laughs> could read them because mine look like that they're horrible but uh the uh first question though the uh it seemed like most people had uh uh use for the model but like sean said it's sort of that but you know there's different missions uh you know like uh uh anna from scotland you know they have all these different uh uh you know battlefields and castles and different sorts of uh um places and it seems like a lot of what their intention is is to uh increase visitation and keep the public interested so you'd, you know you'd have to score based on what what brings in the people what brings in the visitors what's popular what uh, gets people in so you know tailoring your uh your uh, model to fit your mission is important there um in uh, essence of time i'll just uh jump to the um, well, okay, you know, Rupert from RHS Wesley was talking about, uh, you know, their, uh, their goal is to, you know, collect as many new varieties as possible. So they're always wanting to turn over old collections into new collections, but they don't want to lose lasts of kinds and things like that. So they, uh, you know, have a, a mixed message of uh, collecting, uh, of a keeping variety, but also bringing in the new and how that scored. Um, on the second, the hard to measure, I had mentioned uh, one that I often talk about is uh, we tie this um, to our to our uh, disaster. Well, actually, that was more on the first one. I'm sorry, um, but we tie this to our disaster preparedness plan. Um, so uh, having a way to uh, score the value of plants that might be under threat from storm or damage. A tree falls on a bed, you know, what's the most important plant in there to dig out, rescue, propagate first. Um, so that's that's uh, that point. But then the uh, uh, I think the most valuable in my mind from the second question was. Uh, it's all well and good on the records, but uh, how do you uh, translate this value scoring to both the public and even your own staff? You know, how do your staff know what? What are the most important plants plants in the collection? Not everybody gets to look at the records. Um, uh, some gardens in England uh, do uh, color coding of labels, uh, so certain plants of higher value have different color labels. Um, so there's and you know heritage value. I mean you know there's uh, um, those are my random notes. Does anybody from my group have anything more sensible than that? <laughs> Apparently not. So my insensibility yeah. will, will, will go on. 
Uh, thank you. I, I love the. Uh, I mean that that aspect of the disaster preparedness we've seen. I, I'm re always reminded about the uh, the greenhouses in uh, Smithsonian where you they have mm. these reflexes. So when the lights goes down, you can use a, a torch. And all the ones with the red reflex are the high value ones. It's like an example of being ready for anything kind of thing. But uh, I know we've got chime in real quick. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, in terms of, I was thinking um, of of uh, comparing disaster preparedness for us to um, um, development of an area, say for a new uh, a construction zone, and what are the most valuable plants that need to be um, salvaged uh, versus ones that we can um, uh, not salvage, basically. Which ones have to be salvaged first? Uh, which ones can be divided? Which ones can be propagated? in terms of um, which ones are most valuable when we have to do a complete area redevelopment. So that's kind of like in, in, in line with the disaster preparedness for us, but it, in terms of, you know, uh, building, developing areas. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting aspect of hard to repropagate kind of that suddenly uh, in that context probably would increase the value of make sure you keep it kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, we're going to run a bit over time. I hope people are okay with that. Uh, but we'll, we'll, I think for the sake of this uh, discussion, it's, I find it very interesting. So hopefully people are okay. We will keep the, the, the recording going. So if anybody feel like they have to go, uh, that, that's uh, of course not a problem for us, but uh, sorry about uh, not keeping track of time so well today. Uh, I suppose we had a large big crowd, which is very nice. So <laughs> that's the downside of that, but that's great. Uh, so moving on, uh, uh, lots of interesting stuff here, I must say. Uh, moving on to uh, the room with uh, Connor, Ryan, and Dawn, and Emily, Ray, and Alison. Who is somebody on mute? Yeah, I'm going to do this one for our team. Thank you, Howard. Um, so hi, I'm. Alison from the National Trust in England. So I've got a lot of um, similarities with things that Rupert and Anne were saying um, about heritage. But um, so I'm going to do really quickly. We were so basically we've covered the sort of reports to donors question because you know everything about keeping keep necessary to keep track, keeping consistent, and basically justifying decision making. So would we use a model? Absolutely yes fundamentals first lots of um the people in my group have um <laughs> are still trying to get the good data together so there's a kind of obvious concern that yeah a model sounds wonderful and wouldn't it be nice um but we haven't quite got there yet um in terms of the second question we've got a couple of other things that aren't actually on there um which are to do with sort of other mission statements that can't quite find a way to score. So for example, fostering a connection to nature, how mm -hmm. would that be, be scored? Um, the sort of general sort of therapy, well-being, feeling good, how does this plant contribute to, to that? How does a, a plant contribute to a sort of education value if that is a key part of your mission statement? Um, and um, from my perspective, how, how can you measure with a number the significance of a plant to a particular site? So some of the stories that you were mentioning, and, and, you know, the sort of um, UNESCO spirit of place. If it, how can you measure that a plant is contributing to the spirit of place of a particular property? Um, and last, but by no means least, adding on to the disaster preparedness plan, it's how you how you score risk to things, you know, some of those major things. I mean, um, it was mentioned, you know, a tree falling over, but the, the changes due to climate change, due to increased flooding, due to, you know, yeah, more and more storms. And I'm, I'm guessing a lot in the States is fire risk and things, but even in this country, um, in, in the UK now, fire risk on moors, et cetera. Um, how, how you manage that um, and how you score that. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's really interesting. I, I think what, what, I, what we see here, I feel, at least, is that this is like a tool that, you know, if, if we do this right and that you get a tool where you can actually measure this, I think there's a lot of new opening, opening up new horizons and ideas about how you can do this. And just this idea of having two separate collections like Greg and, and uh, uh, 
yeah, that, that was talked about. Uh, I was also just on the on that note from from Rupert when he said new species are interesting, so they should be valuable. And again, that time aspect. In a couple of years, it's not new anymore, and and <laughs> sort of it's such a dynamic kind of uh, sort of uh, place. This uh, so and and I, I think some of the things you mentioned here, like therapy, therapy well being uh, well being aspects, etc. Uh, there must be some way of quantifying that because it's a subjective or semi-subjective sort of, you can't say based on the taxon or something. There are several components that identify that particular aspect. So there might be some way of, uh, you know, tagging plants for some reason to 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 say that this is, uh, gives us that uh, sort of sense of space or whatever you're looking for uh, to, to be able to answer those questions. But it's still tricky, I'm sure. So So there's more to be, looked at here, but that's very useful. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have uh, also the room with uh, Ben, Christopher, Martin, and Pete, and Zinnia. Is somebody on mute or have somebody? Uh, do you have a speaker? Ben, great. Uh, you're on mute, but okay. There we go. Um, so we um, uh, we didn't get um, very far. We got um, talking about well, um, Pete was uh, uh, discussing the process that they've been following at Cambridge. So you know they're they're ahead of us for for much of this. Um, and one of the things he, you know looking for the rarity in the collections and doing it through um, a BGCI search and finding there were huge number of plants that apparently they were the only holders of. And then when they went and checked and found it's actually a synonym. So therefore, you know, that rarity um, disappears quite quickly, but or, or not, who knows. But um, we're having a conversation about, you know, agreed taxonomy because one herbarium, one data source may not agree with somewhere, somewhere else. So, you know, that's, um, that's a, 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 um, a thing you're gonna have to, you know, make a, Decisions to which taxonomy you follow and presumably stick to it. Uh, and then um, we were looking at um, Chris um, obviously manages large collections of heritage plants, and the value there is obviously um, uh, sometimes it's just you know it may only be valuable because there was someone associated with it who may have been no particular um, global importance, but maybe very important to that local site. Um, and it's, I mean, the same for us here at Edinburgh, we have heritage trees in our collections and we've got um, trovi trees uh, and all those sorts of things. So, um, and when I worked in, in Sydney, we, we had trees that were given value because um, they framed a nice view. I mean, it was fairly bizarre, but um, there were lots of nice views at Sydney. So a tree may well have made a particular setting. Uh, so, um, and then, um, but also not only the science and conservation value, but the horse cultural, the amenity, and so on. So all of these other values, you know, we're just basically added to an ever growing list, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I uh, that that's exactly I, it relates to what what uh, uh, what the, the National Trust uh, referred to. I suppose these beautiful oaks on our hilltop kind of scenario. <laughs> yeah. And, but but the other aspect that you pointed out that we haven't talked too much about, but. Uh, creating a system like this is sort of uh, intrinsically linked to the the values and the the data set that you self manage, and and what the story that you talked about here with Cambridge actually looking at uh, BGCI's data set about and targeting those collections that are not very often find in ex situ collections. You might have ten plants of that, but you're the only one. So that that definitely should uh, increase its in significance. Uh, mm. And and uh, that's an interesting story going forward in, in you know in this in our day and time that maybe some of these kind of data like IUCN data as well it would be nice to get that just fresh from IUCN instead of having today I think it's quite a bit of a laborious thing to keep your keep track of this stuff so that you have fresh and, and accurate data uh, about all these things uh, but yeah thank you so much that's really really useful and, and interesting uh, I don't know if anybody else had any comment on the feedback we've had so far. Um, we, as I said, just to repeat, we're going to put this, share it on the blog so you can digest this with a few links, etc., and hopefully uh, keep this dialogue going. But uh, any any last comments before we round this wonderful sort of uh, 
yeah, <laughs> topic of for today. Um, Harvin, I mean, I think one of the things which we kind of touched on in our group is the, the importance of being able to communicate this information. I mean, it has been touched on, but I think it, um, the importance of communicating it, how do we communicate this information to the horticulturists who are looking after the plants so they know so we don't lose that and all the public. So I think it's just making that, you know, we can have all these lovely stuff, but if we can't communicate it, it just gets lost. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, the, the, the for me as a sort of trying to answer questions with technology sometimes here, I think uh, uh, having access to the data when you're out there and, and having this particular aspect really visceral, you know, very, very accessible to everybody who's working in the garden, uh, you can then, uh, you know, you, you can then assess, oh, shall I keep this plant alive or not kind of thing, because that's the kind of scenario we talk about, I suppose. Um, I, I suppose also you could uh, look at, you could see this kind of, uh, I don't know, you get a notification when somebody deaded off a, a really high ranking plant. So you can, you know, that's too late, obviously, but <laughs> you get, you, you hopefully this will help you to get an institutional knowledge about this, these aspects. So uh, if that person is then, I don't know if it's going to be reprimanded for not looking after it properly or not, but they're, they're sort of, uh, it at least gives you some tools, but I, I agree with you uh, that, that, that kind of uh, the way to communicate that somebody mentioned this to put it on the label is also quite an interesting aspect uh, to, to, to help people. So, but some people don't have labels. It's, it's a complicated story, but a very good point at least. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to go back to our uh, slides then and and try to round off a bit. Um, uh, so so um, just give me a few seconds here. Uh, the the uh, the story here is that uh, we we have our collection and 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 uh, uh, you know there's a different parts of your institution and, and, and outside your institution that in, in, is involved in this. And, and as you pointed out, Pete, that uh, how do you communicate the value? Uh, and we believe value scoring can really help that uh, uh, in, on, on making curatorial decisions uh, and also how you prioritize, what do you keep and what you don't keep. Uh, there's some wonderful talks about, you know, that you know, new, new curators come in, they see plants that are not valuable, take them out uh, and focus on the ones that are essential, etc. But also this, I think, uh, by having this, it really makes it more purposeful as well to have accurate and, and, and data uh, because you suddenly can use this as a strategic tool in your collection uh, and uh, communicating to donors and, 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 uh, and management in a, in a consistent manner. You know, last year we had, 2049 or whatever, <laughs> and this year it's higher or lower. And, and then you can understand why this is happening. Now there is a caveat, and that is what we talked about at the last session, it was really useful. You can't, you shouldn't be complacent to think you're measuring everything. And that's probably what you might end up doing if you're, if you're not sort of on the ball here in that there are certain aspects that are very hard to capture uh, from a metric perspective. And, and that's probably where these conversations will keep on going. Uh, how do you make sure you uh, understand the value? Uh, and this is obviously not precision work. It's, it's, a, it's more of a sense of being able to sort of push your collection in the right direction. Um, and of course, this will help you to evaluate in a different way than you could before. Uh, so so uh, we're truly excited about this and, and definitely going to work on in, in Hortis and uh, uh, to, to let, make sure this, this, this kind of capabilities are available from early on. Um, I don't know if there's any other comments. Wahid, would you like to add to this? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to mention going back to our vanity versus actionable metrics and the, the fact that a value score like this shouldn't become a val vanity metric. It, it shouldn't just be evaluated and, and you can't let it sit there. You, you obviously need to do something about about your collection and do something with that data. So whether it's you know adding new material or going to sort of reassess or repropagate some material, uh, and the point is you want this value to feed into the way you manage your collection and and really invest the time to understand what what matters 
Um, so, so your your collection policy is well articulated, and, and that whole continuous evaluation process uh, helps to to grow your collection, and, and in terms of its value uh, for conservation. So, yeah, and and all the other the missions that that are out there. So, yeah, I think it's important to to bear that in mind, and and we're very excited to uh, be able to be working on this. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we're over time already by 50 minutes. We apologize for that. Uh, but I don't know if anybody has any closing comments or thoughts. Uh, we'll obviously follow this discussion on with our blog and everything else. But uh, anybody have anything else to share before we round off? Yeah, Pete? Um, it just kind of occurred to me that there's a danger with, with all these different scoring metrics. You, you can end up with, if you end up with one score or one flag, you can actually lose some other ones. So say something comes up, it's of high conservation value and it's rare in the collection, but it might, all, and it'll get a high value, something getting much lower value, but actually it's got a, it isn't being kind of looked at so carefully because it you know, might just be aesthetically really pleasing plant, but still a very valuable plant. So, you know, it's almost like you need multiple scoring sessions, you know, like a flag for horticultural value or conservation value or, so you have a whole range of different values. You can add, and maybe you can add all those up together, but you can flag them all up and, you know, red yet, you know. I'm just trying to, so you don't just lose everything in, in one score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Maybe there's a way to, uh, you know, some tools to explore your collection from all the metrics you measure so that you can, you know, it, it, it's hard to bring that uh, sort of, that kind of information on the fly as oh you, we we cannot you guess that you're actually interested in culture you know horticultural value or something uh, yeah. but I, I see your point it, it's sort of it's you could argue that gold silver bronze is dumbing it down but I think it makes it much more accessible but then having ability to explore why does it get gold or silver uh, and but uh, I suppose significantly getting those who have any ranking uh, visible and those who don't. Uh, at least there you get a start so that you can see what, what you need to focus on. But it's a, it's a, I think we just need to build up experience uh, from, from a community perspective and then, uh, then keep on iterating and improving and, and uh, both from a measure uh, metrics perspective, but also from a user experience perspective as well. Okay, on that note, I thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll send out, uh, so those who do subscribe to our blog, they get a reminder to, for these sessions. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining.